What do these very much anticipated inflation figures tell us? Well, they tell us a few things, Sarah. Um, we this graph we prepared earlier um, shows that uh, what the Reserve Bank was looking for was this really clear trajectory that rates were heading down. And I think you can see from those figures now that we are starting to get that inflation peaked in the December quarter of, uh, at the end of last year. And we've now had two quarters where it's falling away. So that's really great news. Mm. Um, and it really uh, sort of will be a great relief to the government as well as, uh, as as everybody else. Before we come to the politics, and and actually before we even break down that trend, just because this is what people want to understand mm. most acutely, what impact will it have on the RBA's meeting next week when it makes its next rates its next next try that again, Sarah? Its next rates decision. Well, um, the markets are saying that uh, it basically sort of more or less removes uh, or greatly reduces the chances of another interest rate rise. Um, the governor said in his last statement, you know, uh, that that rates were still flowing through the system. As we've discussed before, it takes 12 months mm. for them to flow through. So I think uh, the likelihood is that it will be unlikely that uh, the governor moves again, or sorry, the Reserve Bank moves again um, on rates on the back of these numbers, particularly given the other indicators in the economy. And how universal is that view amongst economists today? It's not completely universal mm -hmm. uh, because there are underlying trends in those numbers which still show that there are problems. And I think they go more to the rate of decline in inflation rather than the likelihood that it's going to go back up again. Mm -hmm. um, for example, services, um, are grow services uh, inflation is growing at the highest level in a couple of decades. Now, that's about rents, uh, but it also contains some aspect of wages. So... They're, they're things that the, the bank can't really con control so much. Um, we've seen goods inflation decline, which is uh, because they have more direct impact on, um, on or d direct effect from uh, monetary policy, but it's harder to get that services number down. Nobody's <laughs> suggesting there's a wage price spiral at this mm. stage, but there will be knock-on effects of continuing wage rises. And of course, in these numbers, you've had the highest increase in rents uh, since 1988. Mm. Um, so that's something that's pretty hard for the Reserve Bank to control given the shortage of housing in Australia. There was a lot of discussion around unemployment recently. Now, how do these figures relate to that persistently high uh, employment figure? So we've continued to see this incredibly strong labour market. Um, in, in the simplest of worlds, there's this trade-off of inflation to unemployment. Um, and uh, Michelle Bullock, the incoming governor, got into a bit of strife publicly because she made the observation that um, you know, the equation says if inflation is to fall to here, unemployment has to rise to here. Now, that, that is one of those uh, all things being equal statements that economists make. Mm. Um, but without a doubt, I think the fact that the, wages mark, that the employment market remains strong, but you have got some improvement in inflation is, is good news. Um, it reduces the risks of it being a really savage recession. But I think there are still big problems in the fact we're starting to see lots of cracks in the economy and particularly in business and consumer confidence. Now, what about the politics of this? Obviously, this is good news, but it's also good news for Phil Lowe's uh, much discussed narrow path to a good landing at the end of this, these very, very high rates. Does it, does it reflect at all on Jim Chalmers' decision to replace Phil Lowe, that it seems to be going the way he wanted it to go? Uh, well, I think it's still a very narrow path, Sarah, so um, you know, we'll have to wait and see on that. But I don't think Phil Lowe was um, replaced because of uh, his calls on, on interest rates. Uh, I think pragmatically it was about the fact that, unfortunately, his credibility, apart from anything else, um, in commenting or uh, sort of signalling monetary policy had been dented by mm. that forecast of uh, rates not rising till 2024 and a few other mis mis uh, mis misspeakings. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that, that I think, is the, the real problem. So I don't think it changes um, what we should see in that decision. All right, I want to talk to you about the Productivity Commission report because it's got a new report out on Indigenous disadvantage, specifically closing the gap targets. Now, it has obvious immediate relevance for the voice debate. What is the significance of what the Productivity Commission is saying? 
Well, I think it's a very interesting report, Sarah. What they've done is they've uh, reviewed the decision or the agreement that was made by all levels of government uh, led by Scott Morrison in 2020 uh, to redo the agreements on trying to close the gap. So this isn't about those regular numbers that we get about how we're going on closing the gap. This is about what governments are actually doing to achieve that. And that agreement basically said, look, we should be jointly um, finding ways of uh, getting better outcomes with Aboriginal-led groups. So this is basically goes to the heart of the argument that you, sh you should be consulting and working with Indigenous-led organisations. And what the Productivity Commission says is basically governments have been woeful at this. They have not done it. Uh, they've tended to still either hold on to um, delivery of services or given them to NGOs, not so much to Aboriginal-led organisations. Even when they have given them to Aboriginal-led organisations, they've said to the organisation, well, you do it the way we want to do it. So I think it's a really interesting reflection because the Productivity Commission, which really isn't a bunch of bleeding hearts, actually says without a doubt the data shows that when you do give Aboriginal organisations control of these programs or some say in them, you do get better outcomes. So I think it's a very powerful document in support of the case which you'd have to say isn't being made incredibly strongly on that government delivery uh, level about you know, what the voice can actually bring to both services for Aboriginal people and efficiency of government service delivery.